Good evening, everyone, and good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you all for coming today to the roundtable of the uh, new Digital Design Forum, and welcome everyone who's watching us on the streaming platforms Bilibili and YouTube. My name is Eva. I will be your host and moderator of today. Uh, so before introducing to this event, I'd like to thank everyone who participated to make it happen. And thanks to our friends and followers who kept following the event from a rough idea to today in this rel relatively short period of time. Uh, we have reached uh, 13,000 of viewers at the same time last night at our roundtable seminar on digital art and fashion. Without your strong support, active and kind collaboration from our guests and a lot of help from our volunteers, this wouldn't be such a success. So uh, thanks again to everyone. Hope you will have a great time tonight. Uh, so first, let me welcome uh, our curators, Hu Peng, Liu Xing, and Yu Ting to introduce themselves. Hi, hi everyone. Good morning, good night, good evening, and welcome everyone to our roundtable discussion. I'm Hu Peng, one of the curators. I study architecture in the University of Hong Kong. And right now I'm the co-founder of the Mark II Meta project which is an architect plus metaverse group. I'm also a cross reality designer, VR artist, and game architecture designer. Also, I'm currently working as a game architect for MiHoYo, one of the top level game company in China. Next, let's welcome the, the other two amazing creators, Liu Xin and Yu Jing. Thank you, Paul. Hi, everyone. So happy to see you tonight. Oh, you are not tonight, you are in the Afternoon, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, my name is Yu Ting. Yeah, I'm uh, one of the curators of New Digital Design Forum. And I'm also an art uh, architect, 3D, 3D artist, and uh, installation designer. Um, I was graduated from Columbia University and Design Arc from LA. From LA. And um, um, as a future-facing designer, my experiments with emerging digital technologies and the combines multiple medias. Uh, I'm trying to blur the boundary between the digital and the phys physical world by practicing architectural space, volumetric video, artificial uh, 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 AI, and immersive experiences. Um, and right now I'm working with some um, fashion brands and with like uh, Burberry, Bose, and uh, some other uh, companies to do some um, like mixed reality projects. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yuti. Welcome. Um, and Liu Xin, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Liu Xin. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a designer, director, and a digital artist. Uh, I'm currently studying at Harvard University Graduate School of Design with seconds. The video is stuck. Okay. Yeah, I'm currently studying at Harvard University Graduate School of Design, uh, focusing on the media and the technology. Uh, I was originally trained as an architect. I graduated from Uni of Liverpool and uh, SciArc previously. And I, I used to work at Manchester before. Uh, I mainly work on various mediums such as architecture, multimedia in installation, motion graphics, mixed reality, and 3D scan. Uh, and my practice centers around the influence of digital and physical on shifting the boundaries of the design of spaces, objects, and the perception experience. Uh, in collaboration with Yu Ting, another curator, we, we have also um, running a creative studio called Play.Work. And we have fortunately collaborated with brands such as Burberry, Post.Cars, Wallpaper Magazine, uh, London Fashion Week, uh, and uh, some other musicians to bring architecture think into their uh, music videos. Uh, thank you, and uh, I hope to have a great conversation with you guys. Thank you, Liu Xing. Uh, next, uh, I would like to thank the Global Knowledge Lifeform, a nonprofit uh, educational organization based in China, who has always supported us to organize and hold events. I'm very pleased to introduce this international organization to you. 
Uh, Global Knowledge Lifeform is a nonprofit uh, educational organization initiated by the Professor Zhou Rong from Tsinghua University, which aims to spread professional knowledge and information in arts and humanities, especially in the realm of architecture. We believe in daily efforts, selfish dedication, and contribution. The latest ideas could be brought worldwide to students and scholars in China while breaking the, the language and regional barriers. Uh, now, let's invite our executive editor, Tai Shi Yu, uh, who represents the organization and herself, to give us a quick speech. Oh, thank you very much, Eva. Hello, everyone. Um, tai Shi executive editor of Global Knowledge Lifeform, and we are a young global organization with over 1,000 academic volunteers all over the world. We have uh, been working on academic content translation and production for four years, and it's our great honor to have such a chance to organize this forum. Today's guest's amazing words and inspiring thoughts truly have significant influence, and thank you all for coming. On behalf, on behalf of Layphone, please let me give my uh, great thanks to our host, Eva, and the team behind her. This forum is not possible without the excellent curating jobs of Liu Xing, Hu Peng, Zhu Yuting, Eva, and many volunteers. Thanks to Amber, Chen Bei Jia, Elian, He Dan Ning, Hua Jie, Jasmine, Li Qifan, Ning Yifu, Liu Jing, Liu Zhanyuan, Luo Jing, Ning Si Ling, Shi Jian, Sophia, Tang Ziye, Tang Hao Heng, Wang Yuehua, Xiang Tian Shen, Ye Yilan, Yi Lei, Yolander, Yu Yang, Feng Hao Zhou, Zhang Pei Shan, Zhu Shilong, Zhu Kang Fu. And thank you again and looking forward to the coming forum. Thank you. Thank you, Shi Yu. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we have a strong community behind us. Among them are thousands of architecture students studying all, of, all around the world, scholars, educators, and community members from different backgrounds. And I'm very exciting to see this happening in China, especially in this particular year. So let's look forward to what's gonna happen in the coming years. Uh, and if you're interested in this knowledge sharing platform, uh, please feel free to connect with us. Uh, so now uh, let's jump into the topic of today. Uh, let me quickly introduce uh, the forum, New Digital Design. Uh, New Digital Design focuses on digital and post-digital. It is a series of events that discusses the new meaning, future impact, and novel application of digital in design. The topics are transdisciplinary, including architecture, art, fashion, motion graphics, and business, etc. New digital design can be any design strategy or method that is not constrained in the past digital age. The participants include architecture and design professors, designers, and digital artists in practice and pioneers in the industry. Uh, we will have four roundtable seminars about art, architecture, and the metaverse with theory, exhibition, workshop, and article translation publication. If you're interested in this event, please follow our official account and stay tuned. And uh, for those who's watching us over streaming platforms, please also share the link to your friends. Um, and let's begin with today's panel. Um, today's panel is the first panel of the post-digital and digital in architecture. We have divided this event into two panels for different time zones. So our guests today are mostly based in Europe and the next will be hosting in at the end of August with the same format and with our guests based in North American time zones. Throughout this period, uh, we will be posting publications and deliver art article translations from authors around the world. Please stay tuned. Mm, so in the face of the post pandemic, uh, pandemic era, new questions have been posted with regards to our relationship with time and space. In the contemporary context, today's forum will discuss from a theoretical standpoint what new digital relates to and signifies beyond the immediate physical realities. Um, today we have four extremely talented and renowned guys uh, architects, the world builder speaking with us. So I'm really honored to introduce everyone to you. Uh, we have invited 
Jack Self, the author of The Big Flat Now, that has inspired us to hold this event. Um, we have Sean McCollum, aka iHeartBlob. He's an architectural designer and digital artist. And we have co-founders of Space Popular, educator and designer, Lara Lesmis and Frederick Halberg. Um, for today's panel, we will have two sessions with a break. In the first session, each guest will give us a presentation to share their work. And after we take a short break, in a second session, we will have a free discussion that will last around an hour to two hours, depends on what the format goes. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome our first speaker, Sean, to begin his presentation. Um, as I have introduced Sean, um, his work investigates the impact of new technologies upon uh, socio-political cultures through ephemeral architectural objects and installations. His projects, which explores accessibility and integration of digital technologies within existing physical structures, have received a, a variety of awards and have been published internationally. As a researcher, Sean will, uh, has served as a traveling fellow in China, investigating the interplay of mystical historical ruins just uh, deposed with new consumer lead architectural objects and under occupied megacities. With his interest in hybridized realities, Sean has taught uh, workshops on augmented reality and virtual reality through experimental workflow. Uh, so let's welcome Sean to begin his uh, speak with us. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much thank for you, the, the kind words as well. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen with you guys. All right, yeah, hopefully we'll everybody see can see this. Yep. Yeah. Cool. So um, today I'm going to mostly go through the work of our studio, I Heart Blob, um, give you kind of a, an introduction into the work that we've been working on over the past five years, um, from publications to installations to architectural pavilions and pretty much everything else in between. Um, so yeah, let's, let's get started. So there's three of us in I Heart Blob. I'm the, the green one in the middle, <laughs> and Sasha's to, to my left, and Ben to my right. And we kind of started the studio with a, I guess, a fascination um, of kind of combining architecture and technology, and this kind of broader context of digital technologies or digital architectures, and looking at the, the combination of physical and digital uh, components. Um, and we've kind of worked on pretty much everything, mixed reality and XR uh, since 2016 um, from both a theoretical standpoint and then also um, obviously our practice as well. So we started the studio, I guess, in a kind of a, a standard way now, but at the time it, it felt very bizarre. So we started every day producing designs and uh, renderings and kind of posting each day um, a, a single architectural object uh, to social media. This in this case, it was an Instagram, but um, I guess it doesn't matter which platform you're you're doing this on. It kind of worked upon this idea of the everyday, which was beginning to get quite popular at the time uh, with people like people. Um, and alongside these uh, short or these small architectural projects, um, there was a piece of theoretical and conceptual text. And the idea was to ignite and provoke kind of conversation. This was something we, we felt was missing from um, our own educations, but also missing from the architectural discourse in general. And if you're familiar with our work, uh, you'll be aware that these first kind of one object became 10, then it became 100. And then we've now got over a thousand of these like different projects and, and work that have been kind of produced every single day um, for the last four or five years. So with each kind of new object we develop, um, the idea for us, especially in the form making and the design aspects of things, was to kind of challenge new architectural qualities in quite playful ways. Um, and at some point, we kind of had so many of these objects that um, they started kind of stretching beyond the, the physical world and their own world um, into um, 
and then we start developing into augmented reality and thinking about how these architectural objects might transpire out, out of the Instagram, out of uh, the space uh, that we were kind of navigating within. And then quite quickly, you've produced all this work and realized to yourself that you've generated your own data set. Um, and we, we did what any sensible set of architects would do. And we asked a, a machine essentially to try and replicate our work um, and start to produce more. So you can see on the left is the training set and on the right is the, the actual production of what the machine was generating. Like this is a couple of years ago that we actually produced these. Um, so it's quite low res, quite pixelated, um, but you can start to see some of these like emerging uh, reflections and forms and even some like uh, differentiation between the foreground and the background. So again, quite early steps, but um, definitely something that we've been thinking about revisiting on a more um, thorough scale. And then because we started doing all these projects every single day and we tried to add new complexity into every project and we did it within what we were calling series. So every 100 projects, um, we defined a new set of rules and new ideas um, for you know, furthering this complexity and richness that we were developing through the projects. Um, and at one point they became so complex that we were designing our own biomes and their surroundings, their landscapes, the, the cities that they might inhabit uh, to a point where they were inhabiting each other's space. And we generated this whole um, city and island essentially where these art architectural pieces, or architectural designs were kind of in correlation with each other. They had a, a language differentiation in, at times and also um, a communication between, between each other. Again, thinking about these are every single day projects. But then the architectural object, like I said before, began to kind of stretch beyond the screen and it started populating our own world. So we did that through augmented reality and kind of bearing in mind this was early 2017 um, where there was kind of limited capabilities for, for most phones and um, especially on the side of uh, AR. I don't even think Instagram had released the uh, the open beta for Spark AR, which meant that face filters and things like that were also still in the, the very beginning stages. But what's really nice about this is that we were able to distribute and share so much of our work across the world. And we kind of took them with us. So when we lived in LA, there was objects that were distributed. There's some in London, Glasgow, Hong Kong, Iceland, Estonia, uh, Vienna, and and a lot of other places as well. So yeah, here's a kind of close up of some of these ones. The first one on the left here, this lives in, in LA. The second is in Istanbul. And the third is in uh, Wienmitte in Vienna, which is a, a shopping mall attached to a train station. So as they began to kind of take on their take over, I guess, our physical world. Uh, they then became kind of one with us and started traveling with us as well, personally. And we started to think about how we could use our bodies to kind of transform um, the AR or how the AR could transform our bodies, but not in the traditional sense of what we were speaking about at the beginning of this call of um, how when we're on Zoom or, or anything like this, we can actually maybe alter our faces for filters. Um, but it was more like exploring how these kind of strange speculative design experiments um, could allow us to begin to understand um, architecture, space, and this negotiation between uh, physical and digital worlds and how, how we interact with, with digital, digital interfaces. And this is something that's directly applied to the way that we've been approaching architecture, both on the, the built side and the way that we're designing um, digitally as well. And as you'd have guessed, uh, the primary tool of the studio became augmented reality um, and it's acting as a, a liminal scanner between both physical and digital space. Um, so the studio had started to pick up a little bit of pace by this point and we were starting taking on projects and exhibitions, some publications and with every commission or every kind of opportunity they were given, the idea was to combine or contrast or think about both physical and digital entities um, together, whether that's of just an extension of the physical or if they're in juxtaposition, maybe they, they complement each other. 
Um, and this was, was part of the thinking behind this uh, digital Baroque pavilion, uh, which was in Vancouver. So within this project, we kind of tried to push the boundaries of, of what people understand and know as architecture. So on the, the physical side of things, sure, we're very patternized and textured and uh, quite, I guess, in some cases, flamboyant, I guess, um, with the, the colors and, and so on. Um, so it sure it attracts some attention, but it's just a quite a simple kind of monopoly-esque house, um, I guess, a, in some ways, an architectural primitive. Um, but by adding these new layers of extension um, with augmented reality, we were able to kind of and think of architecture more closely aligned to this idea of software. Um, so you can see that the architecture, it grows, expands from two dimensional faces to three dimensional. It starts shifting scales. There's um, ways in which people can actually interact with it, even through simple things like being able to tap the screen and initiating uh, animations um, or revealing something. Um, and for us, it was one of these interesting things to see how people um, directly interact with these uh, pieces of architecture through their phones. And you'd be surprised at how seamless this, um, this actually is, especially for this project that we're primarily using uh, social AR. So most people in uh, Vancouver anyway have uh, Instagram and just being able to scan a QR code instantly pop up the, the effects um, and give you that opportunity to kind of expand the, the physical world uh, has been really, really quite exciting for us. And you can kind of see here on, on the left is what we actually designed um, before producing the, the, actual, the 3D, I guess, representation of the, of the original digital 3D, um, where we're designing this kind of what we were planning or what we were thinking about at the time was this Baroque pavilion or Baroque facade um, that questioned notions of scale. So it's a, it's a house, but we're designing it with the, the, I guess the, the granularity of, of a, of a Baroque facade with lots of ornamentation, uh, like this kind of archways and things are, are much grander than they should be for the size of a home. Um, and we're also kind of designing this, uh, as a as a recessed facade and there's like i think yes about five five meters depth um, and then this was was flattened and then actually wrapped uh, around this kind of small architectural primitive and then again transformed back into its kind of strange distorted three-dimensionality um, through through the augmentation so like i said we've been lucky enough to kind of apply a lot of these concepts to a number of kind of exhibitions and shows um, like this pavilion also in, in Canada. We've, we've had a lot of really nice opportunities in Canada. Um, this is Noodle Feed, uh, which was produced in 2020, I think in February, so quite quite early last year. Thankfully, it was the time where we were able to socialize and get out together and enjoy it while it lasted. Um, so the idea was to produce like a endlessly configurable physical noodles um, alongside uh, this idea of a spatialized Facebook style newsfeed, which we were calling the noodle feed. And the idea here was to allow people to uh, create this digital sense of place uh, where people were able to leave small uh, memories, some photos, drawings, text, and these were all actively stored on the noodle feed. So passerbys could come and actually visit it and visit the memories as well and see where people had left kind of small notes or photos with their kids or photos with their dogs and, and so on, um, which was a really nice way, I guess, of interacting with the public, both on sure the architecture is quite fun and playful, the kids loved it, but also there's trying to create this sense of community out of it as well. So like even now, long after the, the pavilions or the installation's gone, um, there's still this, this digital sense of, of place left behind where hopefully you can see this video and people are able to kind of visit the beach in Toronto and see some of these uh, memories that people have left behind and kind of, yeah, understand what, what took place uh, in February and March last year, um, which is really nice, I think, especially since the, the installation is now gone. So we've taken the findings, I guess, or this understanding into how people interact with architecture and potentially could interact with architecture in the future. 
um, from the Vancouver project and the Toronto project and apply it to this uh, new mixed reality pavilion, which kind of demands a little bit less tactility, um, obviously because of the, the current situation. So the, this pavilion's aptly named Arc de Blob, and it aims to make the architecture accessible across the world. So not only for the people that can actually visit it in uh, Toronto, but also for me, for you. So if you scan the, the QR code, um, you can actually place the, the project in your in your bedroom, in your living room, um, which is kind of a nice way to allow people to feel comfortable with the architecture as well. And also allow even for us to actually visit the space because unfortunately due to the, the pandemic, we've, we've not been able to visit the, the, fina the finished construction either. But one of the cool things I think about this project for us was that we were combining um, social AR, so Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, these kind of things, um, with um, construction. So we've seen construction processes with AR before. I'm sure we've seen it with uh, Fologram and the HoloLens and stuff, but we wanted to make it as accessible as possible, as simple as possible, and kind of push the boundaries of like, okay, it's supposed to be a face filler, right? So, but can we use face filters essentially for uh, construction? So you can see on the, the far right-hand side, we actually worked with the contractor to allow them to um, use these social AR and these kind of, I guess, new documentation that we were uh, envisioning to put the, the project together, uh, especially on a ornamentation side of things. And it starts to kind of democratize quite a lot of these processes of construction and um, the, the actual traditional methods of uh, documentation also potentially go uh, out the window. So I guess here's just a, a small comparison of the project uh, from its physical to its digital or digital to physical output. Um, so unfortunately, we weren't able to uh, produce the the base for the the archway, but this is mostly just because of the location. The idea was that it would hold um, the arch, it would keep it down, keep it from flying away or falling over uh, whilst it was on the beach, but um, we rescheduled the things and it became uh, an installation in Toronto's uh, distillery district. So of course, we weren't gonna produce another piece of work without adding augmented reality to the actual um, pavilion as well which has been super nice, like just people being able to share their experience with the, the project in general. We've had hundreds upon hundreds of, of images shared on, on social media, people taking photos of their dogs and, and so on. People, people love taking photos of their dogs with us. Um, it's really amazing. Um, but obviously people are able to kind of explore these portals um, and some of the moving parts of the architecture. And the idea is quite simple, I guess, it's just about changing the way that the public interact with architecture. And again, this is something we've found is in incredibly seamless. It's never been something that feels forced. Um, and it doesn't feel like it's, it's much of a task, especially if it's something so simple that you scan a QR code and then within a few seconds, you're able to interact with the, with the architecture in a new way. So, Taking this interaction with architecture in the city a little bit further, um, we've kind of began exploring the relationship between, um, in this case, modernist architecture and urban planning traditions um, with a kind of future facing approach to augmented reality and uh, people's movements within the city. I guess this is a more clear example of this kind of crossover between physical and digital interactions where perhaps the architecture becomes again, more like software, more reactive, um, and kind of reflects on on the people moving through it. So it questions the the role of architecture as no longer a stagnant kind of concrete entity, um, but again, like software, uh, where architecture can adapt and react to the user's needs and their movements throughout the city. So the architecture kind of reconfigures itself to help direct the the person move through the space. It starts to configure spaces that. Um, or more um, understandable for whether it's a group gathering and, and so on, and taking influence quite a lot from the way that we think of um, the way people move together with something like Pokemon Go, where you can, of course, imagine that people move through the city 
kind of in like data points or datum points. And sometimes there's these like congregations that people come together and, and, and all these kind of things that don't have to be as um, rigidly set, I think, within the city, but can perhaps be more flexible by allowing the architecture to kind of allow itself to reconfigure through uh, a mixed reality experience. So I'll play a short video for you. I'll, I'll only go through a, a smaller part of this video, but um, yeah, like along the way, the user Matt here will uh, he will encounter new landmarks, new uh, new nodes, um, and kind of these newly formed districts. And taken the idea was to take the Barbican estate as a given, and start start to kind of set a three dimensional geometry to manipulate and kind of reconfigure, and thus reflect, I guess, upon um, personal urbanism. So an architecture or an urbanism which um, is personal to you, it's specific, and it reflects the things that, that you do, but also the needs that you that you have throughout the th throughout the space. Um, and you can see a couple of instances of this within the film that focuses uh, on the movement of, of Matt, um, who's here kind of exploring the Barbican for the first time, and all these different kinds of cues that the architecture tries to explain to him as he moves through it. And all of this uh, research, I guess, that we've been working on for the, the past few years has culminated in the release of our first uh, our first book. So we released this um, I Heart Blob Architectural Objects, a new visual language, or Augmented Architectural Objects, a new visual language, um, just in the summer last year, um, which actually has a, a lot of really nice um, long form contributions um, from some of our friends, like Lara and Frederick, wrote a really nice piece for it as well. And there's some some really nice uh, short form pieces of text that are spread out uh, throughout the publication. The book itself kind of tries to break down this kind of barrier to entry within both academic writing and academic thought. Um, I think for us anyway, we understand that from a student's point of view specifically, and even from a practice and architect's point of view, that you can often feel that you need to have read multiple um, philosophies or multiple books, uh, which are all associated with each other before you kind of understand anything, um, especially if you just pick up a piece of architectural theory for the first time. And the idea of these like kind of short bite-sized pieces of text is to, again, like we did at the very beginning of the, the studio uh, formation, was to pose questions, um, provoke conversation, provoke disagreements. Um, so each short piece of text was initially about the size of a tweet. So it, it was initially like 140 words or 140 characters, sorry. Um, but it's kind of been expanded a little bit. So they're, they're a maximum, I think about 200 words. Um, and the idea is to kind of, yeah, question specific things within architectural theory and philosophy and pose um, in sometimes quite questionable answers. but um, Sometimes there are quite um, interesting answers as well that can get the, I guess, some thoughts flowing. Um, yeah, and each each text is individualized. So the fact that you wouldn't have to um, read the full book to kind of understand uh, what's going on is quite a quite a nice thing for us anyway. And again, why would we make a book um, that's incredibly slow and this kind of stagnant process? Uh, without ad adding additional potential to the book. Um, so it was incredibly important for us to, to be able to add this augmented reality component and an app that goes alongside it um, with the idea to kind of, again, we're thinking about architecture more like software. It's updatable, it's editable, um, it's interactive. And we don't kind of think of a book to be any different. Um, we don't want that to be the stagnant process or the stagnant piece of our, our work. Um, so we wanted to allow it to have this this flexibility uh, to kind of fulfill this criteria of being updatable, editable, and interactive. So until this point, I've kind of heavily focused on this notion of physical and digital, um, or the the fidgetal. Um, but I want to speak a little bit about um, purely virtual space or purely online space, um, and this is primarily because of the pandemic and the fact that throughout the last year or so, year and a half, um, 
there's been a desire, I guess, to design space and to validate the design of space um, beyond the physical, so within virtual space as well. And to, I think what's really important for that is the, this notion of validating uh, virtual space because it becomes um, a viable solution for, for architects practicing in the future. Um, so we were commissioned by the Vienna Design Week. The idea was to design a theater, um, purely virtual, um, a web space that people can uh, visit together. They can visit in VR, they can visit uh, just on their desktops or on their mobile phones. Um, and sure, there was like, like I said, there were specific platform constraints, but the idea for us anyway was to kind of develop a new Teatro Olimpico, um, but obviously purely virtually. So, and if you're familiar with the Palladio and Scamozzi project, then you're well aware of this kind of role of perspective within uh, the architecture. There's really only, I guess, one point that's incredibly important within that project. Um, but when you're working purely digital or digitally, uh, there's no gravity to deal with, no materiality constraint, there's no real budget to be considered um, either um, on, a, on a material basis. Um, but what we do have is a range of kind of new techniques. So we have like flat materials that are be possible to be com completely two dimensionalized um, from specific perspectives. And we have the ability to kind of seamlessly project uh, two dimensional artifacts from very specific camera angles, specific views. Um, and the idea for us was to take these really complex primitives essentially, because they're, they're built up of spheres and cylinders and all these things like that. Um, and project them across the space that the architecture starts to reveal and unveil itself, unveil itself um, as you move through the space as well. So it kind of ended up being this like winding ramp, um, which kind of choreographs itself as the visitor moves, um, where there's specific points where the architecture comes into alignment and then it reveals itself. It's actually a three-dimensional object. It's not completely flat and um, the idea, I guess, for that is to, to kind of, I guess, hybridize this kind of complex array of primitives uh, that each gateway is uh, built upon and this flattening uh, that we've obviously been able to render these three-dimensional objects as two-dimensional objects, project them onto the three-dimensional and actually change the way that the geometry is uh, put together. So in a lot of cases, your uh, the actual architecture itself is so disconnected um, that it's actually on una you're unable to kind of piece the uh, the puzzle together and it creates this uh, deconstruction, I guess. So leading on to the last couple of slides that I've got here, our kind of investment or time that we've spent uh, developing, I guess, or contributing to the, the metaverse, uh, it's been broad and long and the idea for us of like exploring physical and digital space and virtual space um, has always been something we've been fascinated with. Um, but we've also been fascinated with the, these kind of notions of decentralization. Uh, and obviously, if you're familiar with like blockchain technology, then there's the decentralization of technology to an extent. Um, and this notion that we could combine the decentralization uh, for a potential immersive internet uh, with new forms of digital property, new forms of currency, and uh, I guess quite importantly for an architect is this notion of uh, collective ownership. So with that and kind of the virtual spaces that we've designed, we were asked to design another by A plus D. And the idea was to speculate on the future of space. So. I guess due to the the times that we're we're living in, um, it was purely virtual. Um, but the idea was to to mint this uh, virtual city on the blockchain, which allows people to, of course, validate it through traditional means of finance, but also allow someone or a collective to actually own a virtual city um, online. Of course, there's there's examples with decentraland and and so on as well, um, that allow you to, for instance, take it there. Um, and obviously like NFTs, they've been increasingly important for the digital art movement. Um, and I think they're equally important for kind of validating virtual space or virtual architecture. And it 
provides this potential um, for architects to work without specific clients and to design architecture for communities, with communities, um, in which the communities can actually own and contribute to uh, through kind of these decentralized processes. So, like I said, the project itself is kind of a small explorative city, uh, which has this kind of potential of ownership. And what we found uh, through doing this is that there's a series of kind of new potentials uh, worth exploring within the blockchain space. And I think that's something that it's it's such a, a growing space um, for, for, for the, the industry in general. But I think it's interesting to think of it from an architect's point of view, because there's an opportunity here to um, validate some of these virtual or hybrid spaces that we've been designing and thinking about um, in a way to, uh, I guess, speculate on a new future for the quote unquote architect. So we took a, a few, so we we minted the whole city essentially on uh, Ethereum, but we took small snippets from the space and kind of visual, visualized them um, towards a level of realism um, in comparison to the to the others, but allowed this to be kind of, again, minted upon a proof of stake protocol. The idea was to kind of further cement this idea of building communities around architecture, but also architecture around communities. And there's a kind of reciprocal process between um, uh, between this process uh, between this connection, uh, which is I think increasingly exciting because there isn't this kind of hierarchy of who determines what or who determines what is uh, the potential of architecture, what is the potential of um, a project within a city, and and so on. Um, and it actually provides a lot of uh, agency to to communities that um, are able to I guess pull together to do these uh, these projects. So the last thing I'm going to leave you guys with is just a, another small snippet of uh, non-fungible tokens. This, so I spoke a little bit about the like purely virtual space or virtual ownership as well. And we've kind of become accustomed to this notion that um, images or videos are what non-fungible tokens are, uh, primarily through people like Beeple that sell uh, a, a collection of images, obviously for um, a, a, an insane amount of money. Um, but I guess one thing that we wanted to do is kind of validate that these virtual entities, these kind of hybrid digital spaces that we're able to uh, distribute can go directly to, to the hands of uh, people that, that want to actually own them. And it, in some ways, it does validate um, the digital process in general and being able to produce this, this work, but also being able somebody to kind of own it or even explore it in their own locations and it makes it uh, far more flexible. I think one thing that's interesting to kind of leave on is uh, because these kind of air rights for augmented reality spaces are, are not fully defined, um, it's kind of a gray area. Uh, we can kind of already envision new forms of ownership uh, of virtual architecture in cities. Um, I would presume through a, a non-fungible process, a non-fungible process, like um, we've done here, but um, in future cities, um, I think very, very soon. And I'll, I'll leave you guys with, with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Um, I'm not sure how to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> ah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> I found it. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I'm glad you you kind of your presentation is really broad and is covering also the field of blockchain, uh, NFTs, and virtual assets. And we're actually organizing another um, conversation tomorrow with uh, digital artists and uh, NFT designers. So uh, it would it would also be nice if you guys can join tomorrow. Um, and uh, let's move next to Jack Self. Uh, Jack Self is the director of the Real Foundation. He is the editor in chief in, Real, in the Real Review. Um, he is the unit master of Diploma 6 in the Architectural Association. Jack's architectural work is focused on domestic space and the pursuit of social equality through housing. He has also curated the British Pavilion and the Venice Architectural Biennale in 2016. Jack's idea have influenced people from many 
different industries. His work inspired fashion worlds, which venues to the idea of space-time homogenization. So let's welcome Jack to give us his speech. Hello, Jack. Thank you very much for the generous introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Uh, thank you for joining My, us. As is, uh, as is classic for uh, um, virtual Sorry, presentations, my internet connection is not good. So I hope uh, you'll be able to hear um, me. We couldn't hear. Okay. That's good. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's I'm just going to keep talking. Yeah. We'll see how we go. Yeah. I don't have a presentation for me. I want to. Sorry, Jack. I think we lost you. Oh, no. Um, yeah, we can hear you now. Uh, it's not quite stable. Uh, what, what about this? Oh, is this better? <laughs> Hello? Hello. Yeah, we can hear you now. Um, okay. Would it be better if Jack turn off the video? Just keep or the audio. Mm, I don't think this response uh, uh yeah can you can you hear me okay without the video yes it's better now okay let's try that and if uh if it cuts out um then we can maybe i can try and find a better network of course it's very ironic that we are talking about the post digital and i can't get a good internet connection uh, but in some ways, maybe I can use that as the beginning of what I want to talk about, um, which is already the fact that we're talking about post-digital and fidgetal um, is to say that there is not a difference between uh, the physical and the digital worlds. Uh, I think this is true, but maybe not for the reason that you might expect. Um, you know, the, the, the digital is, of course, a human invention. I'm really hoping you can hear me okay. Um, cool. Uh, the digital is a human invention, um, but of course it has uh, huge impacts or big impacts on reality. And the invention of digital technologies has transformed our planet and is also destroying its ability to sustain human life. Um, so digital technologies are dangerous for our species in many ways. Uh, that's my kind of starting point. Um, on the other hand, I'm, I'm hopeful about new directions in digital design, uh, but I'm also removed from them, actually. Um, uh, I, I was born in 1987 and when I, when I was born, Margaret Thatcher, uh, Ronald Reagan, and Deng Xiaoping were the rulers of the, of, the, of the major powers. 
Uh, and you can imagine that that's quite a different time before the internet, uh, before really personal computers. Um, the Russian poet uh, Mayakovsky has a beautiful poem, which is a, what it means to be born between two centuries. Uh, and in my case, uh, I live both with a memory of the 20th century, of the pre-digital, the pre-internet era, and of course, with our 21st century. And Mayakovsky says that to be born across two centuries is to be uh, an animal with a broken spine. The legs walk forward, but the head looks back. Um, and that's often how I feel uh, being split between these two worlds. Um, my understanding of the digital is really just a continuation of many other types of information and systems uh, inventions of the last two centuries. Uh, if you think about the invention of bu bureaucracy, uh, let's say in the 1700s and 1800s, uh, the role of bureaucracy was to take very complex information about individuals and about society and try to simplify it until everyone uh, could fit inside these categories. And there's a very uh, dangerous process for me in, in terms of that abstraction, which happens when, uh, when we force people into uh, particular systems. So in that way, I see the digital, many of the digital spheres which exist today are just extensions of bureaucracy, of capitalism, of patriarchy. Uh, and one of the roles that the designer has played in this is slowly removing the body and slowly removing uh, the non-commodified or non-transactional uh, rela human relationships from everyday life. Uh, this is a big uh, thing that I'm interested in. Um, so in, in a way, uh, the early internet was very separate from uh, your personal life and from what we now call the real world or uh, real life. Um, it was described as cyberspace and it was a space which was anonymous and which was largely free from any rules uh, of engagement and right uh, you know all sorts of other you, you there hello Just hello Jack. Checking. Yeah, we lost you for a second. Yeah. And now we can hear you. Yeah, so I, I was just saying that in the in the late 1990s, for example, uh, when I first joined the internet in 1994, um, the, the internet uh, was a place which was very free, very open, uh, where there were no rules of copyright, where there were no rules of uh, ownership uh, that existed in the same way. Um, and then after around... 2006, with the rise of Web 2.0, uh, we started to see a swap between real life and digital life. Um, so previously, in your in the real world, you were subject to uh, surveillance, to monitoring, uh, to uh, controls of your physical presence in space. And the digital was a space to be free, a space to be anonymous. Now it's the other way around. Uh, the digital is a space where you are surveilled, where your data is monitored and controlled. And the only place now where you can be free, I think, is if you can have a real life conversation uh, without your phone. Um, as long as you don't have a smartphone uh, and you're free from digital technology. That's, for me, really the only place of freedom. Um, but I'm also interested in how design plays a role in this. And I have some specific examples. I mean, one of the, one of the things which profoundly changed uh, our relationship between the digital and the physical was the addition of the camera to uh, the phone and of course the rise of social media because 
when you get positive feedback for producing images and putting them on a social network, you begin to see the whole world through the lens of social media. Uh, I think all of us, when we are on holiday, when we are going to a special place, we immediately begin to see the world as if it were a series of Instagram posts or other types of social media posts. So our relationship with the physical has already become highly abstracted. Uh, nobody gets an amazing cup of coffee and doesn't think maybe this would look good online. Uh, it's, it's that level of transformation. Um, the second aspect of this kind of uh, um, removal of the body or abstraction of the individual, I think, is the rise of contactless technology. I'm very sad about contactless technology. Uh, when I was growing up, it was common to have a job working in a supermarket um, at the at the sale point, uh, you know, s swiping with the beep of the products and doing the checkout. Um, but with contactless technology, now, even as an adult, I have to work for the supermarket. Uh, I'm doing the work of putting the objects in the bag. Uh, but more than that, contactless technology is removing a type of conversation, a, a way of relating to other people, which was very important before, because contactless technology um, removes the excuse to talk to strangers. 20 years ago, uh, I used to speak to lots of strangers in the post office, in the supermarket, in the bank, on the street, at the bus stop, in the uh, metro or the subway system. But now I have no excuse uh, because of the rise of contactless technology, which abstracts and turns all of my relationships into transactions. Um, I mean, I could go on, but perhaps the, the final thing I would say is uh, this change between the physical and the digital and the dematerialization of the body and, and our ongoing abstraction, what you might call the abstraction of ourselves, uh, until the self is, is really just uh, no different from um, our virtual uh, constructs, has really accelerated since 2016. Um, and certainly the pandemic has accelerated it even further now the digital takes total priority and the physical is uh, less and less um, uh, relevant to our construction of identity or self. Uh, the example or the metaphor I would give perhaps, um, of course, our, our digital persona are not real uh, and they're kind of a paper uh, version of us. They're two dimensional in the same way that our passport or our driver's license or our identity card, uh, they contain some information about us, which is true, like our date of birth, our first name, our last name, uh, but they don't tell you about your childhood memories. Uh, they don't tell you about your friends uh, because they only present the information which is relevant for you to be categorized and controlled. Um, in the same way, I, I think of social media today a little bit like in China, you have the red plays. Uh, and in the red plays, uh, there are actors which are excited and enthusiastic and are very energetic. Um, and their emotions are not real because they are actors. And the emotions are used uh, to tell a story. Uh, in a way, our digital lives are, uh, are like the actors in a red play. And the real life that we have is the backstage. It's the time when we are taking off the makeup, uh, when we are preparing or rehearsing our lines. And I think this, um, 
relationship between the digital and the physical is, is not a healthy one. Um, I do see though, especially amongst a younger generation, a generation who are perhaps in their early 20s, um, a very different critical relationship with the digital space uh, or digital technology, um, which uh, is uh, really about trying to exit your own bubble, trying to exit the small, smaller and smaller world that your digital persona pushes you into. Um, and uh, uh, trying to find, uh, uh, you know, a kind of um, uh, a broader engagement with civil discourse. Um, the, the very final thing I want to say is about the role that we play as designers and how we think about the relationship between the digital and the physical. Uh, for me, all design has content and it has context. Um, the content I'm not going to tell you about because you will be working on that. You will be making virtual worlds, you will be making uh, all sorts of objects, images, um, entities which exist, and that's up to you. The context, though, is something which we often forget as designers. We get so excited about the content that we stop thinking about the context. And when it comes to context, I always think of how journalists think about context. Uh, every newspaper article always begins with the following categories. Who, what, where, why, when, how. Uh, in those first couple of sentences, they are asking, you know, who is involved? Why are they involved? What has happened? How did it happen? Where did it happen? When did it happen? Um, and I think as designers, we often uh, forget to ask more questions about these categories. Uh, who is asking us to design? Why are they asking us to design? Uh, what did they want to get out of our design? Um, how will our design exist in the world and what type of influence will it have uh, and that analysis of power of wealth uh, and of other types of interests i think is really critical if we are going to use the post digital or the digital to uh, push for greater levels of equality which in my case is what i'm really interested in um, so I'll, I'll conclude there. I hope that this uh, speech without any presentation wasn't too boring and uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jack. Uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, it's really important, uh, like at the end when you conclude, uh, I think for, for us as designers, uh, it's really important to have these sensibilities to contemporary and the presence and what is happening around us and start to question uh, the context. Uh, and I do look forward to a deeper uh, conversation with you later um, after the presentation. And uh, lastly, uh, I would like to warmly welcome uh, Lara Lesmes and Frederick Halberger, um, who is also my mentor and tutor at the AA. Uh, Lara Lesmes is an architectural designer and educator based in London. Together with uh, Frederick Halberger, he, uh, she directs the research and design practice Space Popular, which is a multidisciplinary design and research practice. To teach the research at Mark Unit, the civic program at the Architectural Association in London. Since 2020, they have also taught a research studio at the University of Toronto. To create spaces, objects, and events in both phys physical and virtual space, concentrating on how the two realms will blend together in the near future. And uh, let's welcome our last uh, guests, Frederick Halberger and Laura Lesmes. Thanks, Thank Eva. you so much, Eva. Thank you. Thank you. One second.
Great. Um, so thanks for having us uh, here today. We're really excited uh, to, to be joining the panel uh, and also to be joining the series uh, of events. Uh, it seemed absolutely great. Um, just to give a little bit of um, context, um, Frederick, if you can go to the next slide. Yeah, we, um, uh, we started our practice um, after uh, we had already been teaching for quite a few years at INDA in Chulalongkorn University, which was a, a really important place for us where we spent five years of our lives um, and where we really uh, began to develop uh, and all the different things that we do today. So um, we do, uh, uh, let's say our practice is quite varied. Uh, we move from uh, built work, uh, the, here you see our first uh, self-standing building to uh, a few interior projects uh, that we have been working on that also included furniture. We also worked uh, in our first years, we just did a lot of uh, competition projects uh, that ranged in size quite wildly uh, from urban planning to yeah, like really small things like, like furniture. And uh, in the past year or so, we have been exploring a little bit um, architecture that exists purely um, on the internet. Um, so here are a few examples uh, of spaces that exists um, only online. And these we have been developed, let's say, into different paths that we will cover through the presentation. But we have been de developing uh, through the past uh, five, six years through a, a series of different research projects, um, most of which have manifested um, through exhibitions. Uh, the latest one of them being Freestyle at the RIBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects in London. Uh, and well, all of these pieces having in common um, a physical manifestation uh, and a, a research project that goes with them. So a presentation of an idea or a thesis together with uh, the presentation of um, often archival material um, as well with them. So we're going to just cover a, a few topics that we thought might be exciting to bring to the table that we are listing out here. Um, and uh, yeah, with that, moving on to the discussion after our after our talk. So kind of coming from there, um, we thought we'd show actually our latest project, which is a, a film and a research project for an exhibition at Maxi in Rome, which actually brings together a lot of these interests that we have with the role of media throughout history and the urge to kind of compress information and make it available and how that be kind of historically has become one of our most important energy leaps in, in getting to where we are now. Um, we're also interested, as Lara said, in that list that we saw is now in, in the power of virtual surfaces and the power of compressing the world as we see it. This piece specifically explores the, the huge gap that we're used doing now from two dimensional media into spatial media, looking at the power of the 360 camera and the, the power of being able to compress uh, complex sets of, of environments and, and, and the physical spaces into uh, spaces that don't have any thickness um, and the potential of a new kind of architecture coming from that. Um, and I think linked to almost all of our work we do concerning what the topic of today is, um, our kind of speculation that we believe in is that by the middle of the 21st century, all media will be spatial. And just a snapshot of some of the projects we won't talk about too much, but it relates to our interest. This is a project called Root Domain, which explores what something that Jack just brought up, the very, very real uh, implications of any form of digital environments, especially the ones that are spatial, that are much more heavier, exploring the role of sort of museums and the enormous archiving and uh, the underwater or sub, sub uh, oceanic uh, cables that run across the earth and, and the implications of data centers. We're also really interested in, in the power of, of virtual space and three-dimensional virtual space to show complex sets of information. This is one of our first projects from 2013 called the Cloud of Resilience, which is a global mortality rate database. And uh, we can actually see here um, pandemics uh, showing up as one of the data sets that this would be able to show and the power to be able to explore 
spatial data rather than two-dimensional data. But we'll focus a bit more on this world and the way we bring these sort of ideas to the world, often through the use of VR headsets within our exhibitions and uh, with something that is commonly referred to as location-sensitive virtual experiences, meaning you can see Lara there at the bottom uh, interacting with one of our sculptures while she actually sees something differently. This is something we began exploring in 2015 in Bangkok. You can see here, very, very rudimentary early setup. Um, but examples here, um, as you can see there on the left and the right, uh, one of our earlier exhibitions, The Glass Chain from 2017. And what this kind of then does is bring together something that we refer to as the spatial essay, which is basically a way to communicate complex sets of information through actually being inside of the essay. Um, and in our experience, some of our films are, are no more than five minutes long, but we can actually convey a huge amount of information by actually uh, bringing a human away from their physical context into a virtual context, as long as their body is with them. So this is some examples of the four spatial essays we have produced to date. Uh, as I said, one of the earlier ones is the, the Glass Chain, which reflects on the incredible work by the German expressionists and their view that colored glass would revolutionize the world. Of course it did, not in the way that they imagined, but we kind of created this almost homage to their work by creating a series of ornamentations and this large glass sculpture which speaks about the power of virtual surfaces, be they physical or not. And actually, in our view, it really doesn't matter. A, a digital virtual surface has the capacity to contain more information than a one that's not digital, but they're both virtual. Uh, you can see that glass sculpture right there on the left and all of the other ornaments and fabrics all around. And here we can see then uh, um, Lara experiencing the space through the film where through the power of the glass that she has right in front of her eyes um, a whole different world kind of emerges uh, in this case not um, not through the adaptive means we talk about some differences further on here are some snapshots from from that film i think you're muted lara thanks sorry and yeah, continuing on uh, from from that same point, uh, but perhaps linking it to uh, other ideas that place our understanding of uh, virtual technologies in a much longer timeline, is uh, this project, uh, the Wargion case, developed for the, the Royal Palace in Milan, um, which is actually basically a, a, a very direct continuation of the contents of, the, of that very room, that is the tapestry room in the palace understanding tapestries uh, as, as virtual objects as well, or objects that, I mean, not just because it contains or, or it's flat, um, but uh, because it contains information, um, uh, it compresses it uh, and it makes it therefore portable and so on. So the object that is produced uh, is, is a sort of um, a sculpture that contains a three-dimensional snapshot of, uh, of that story. And uh, the story itself that first was carried in the tapestries, then a snapshot of it is, is captured in, in this new reflective object that is not actually reflective, it's, it's printed, so it's an illusion. Um, and all that is then experienced as well uh, through a, a headset where you can access a, a whole film that, that is taking you through uh, the ideas of well, the compression of information in uh, two-dimensional um, surfaces. Here we see some of the screenshots of what's going on um, in and around the object and basically the physical object becoming uh, like a three-dimensional photograph of everything that is going on in there, linking to, again, the, the story that was first captured in the tapestries in the room of the room where the object sits in. This is something we um, uh, explore in much more depth in, in our exhibition Freestyle uh, for the RIBA in London. And um, related to this, we're also um, deeply interested in, in the broad general um, concept of virtual togetherness of what it means to interact with another human being through some form of mediation, be that 
through writing letters or writing books or any form, whereas obviously what we see today through here in the, uh, an artwork we created last year called um, Phantom Island, um, we're very interested in what happens when we are inside of the media and we're actually communicating through an avatar, which is itself a part of the medium um, where, we being, where we are actually interacting with each other. Uh, we produced um, a special essay in 2019 called The Ven Room, which is exploring not so much the avatars, but the immediate environments where we are, meaning where we live and what will happen with the home when uh, spatial media begins to really overlap our entire homes. This was first shown at the Tallinn Architecture Biennale, curated by Jarel, Jarel Reisner. Uh, we are very interested, as, as we mentioned earlier, in about how previous uh, medias have had similar kind of effects or what effects they have had on our domestic, domestic environments. So to some degree, uh, perhaps it's on the surface seems that not that much, but we would argue that every single inter, uh, intervention has a huge effect. And again, here, to just remind you that we really believe that by the middle of the 21st century, meaning um, around 2050, all media will be spatial, meaning no more screens, no more smartphones, no more laptops, no more uh, projectors even, um, or LED screens out in public. Everything will be done through a device that every single individual carries with them. Uh, this means that the domestic environment, um, every single object has the potential to be, uh, to borrow the, the kind of word that many uses, uh, smart, basically like, a piece of wood has potential to be the key into the most advanced virtual environment. And uh, if this is going to be true, then that means that we will begin to use our domestic environments, our homes, as the kind of setting for these things to interact, and especially when we interact with others from up that live in other uh, spaces. And that's when they overlap is what we then say we will create these Ven rooms. And this is what this project is exploring, that when you have two augmented reality environments overlapping, and you might imagine that two individuals actually live together, but they might be continents apart. Um, so their, their domestic environments will begin to overlap. And then we speculate on the fact that these overlap, some of them might, will start to become more meaningful than just accidents. And they might start to be decorated and ornamented in the same way that we ornament our homes today with everything from houseplants to posters uh, or objects. And eventually creating uh, what in the kind of Marshall McLuhan sense could be referred to as the, the global home, basically one gigantic connected home where all of our domestic environments are scanned in real time, uh, which has its own uh, massive problems we won't go into too much, but just creating this, this kind of endless, endless home, essentially. In, in the same spirit, um, or following the same logic, um, we developed uh, a, a short research project uh, that manifested in the exhibition Value in the Virtual, curated by James Taylor Foster um, for um, ARCTIS, the National Design Museum in Stockholm, Sweden, um, for which, oops, sorry. Sorry, excuse me. Um, for which we developed these uh, 10 propositions for, um, for virtual architecture. Um. So um, here are some uh, snapshots from this exhibition. Um, which really looked at the that's kind of very broad view on what happens to the city and also here in the exhibition itself, which is in, in all of our exhibitions, uh, big interest in um, virtual surfaces. The whole exhibition kind of takes shape through these very, very, very thin digitally printed murals, uh, as you can see here, mounted on scaffolding. Um, and really one of the, the questions of this exhibition and really all of our work is what is the value of virtual architecture or virtual spaces or virtual content at large and we realized that in order to answer this we needed to create some kind of understanding of how we can value physical architecture and at that time we arrived at this very basic list um, to date we are looking at updating this slightly but the interesting thing we realized that to realize what the value of virtual architecture is uh, there are very few that overlap 
And as, as Sean was mentioning, there are many things that do not overlap. Uh, of course, here, um, relating to what Sean said, the issue of energy does actually overlap. It doesn't relate to the way that you um, experience the virtual environment, but any virtual content, even a text message, consumes energy. And being inside a virtual environment, uh, in many cases, consumes a lot of energy, uh, which is comparable to meeting in physical architecture where you need to have heating or cooling or lighting, etc. But we created this series of, of murals that are kind of depicting uh, as a gradient what our public spaces might be like when every single person in experiences them individually. Uh, in this beautiful exhibition space at Arktis in Stockholm, we created a series of kind of speculative scenarios, uh, created a large digitally printed carpet that was served as a sort of map where these sort of scenarios of speculation took place. So uh, an example of the home where sort of the communication coming out of the router is literally materializing live as it's happening or where historical buildings and there in this case in Stockholm gold mosaic takes the shape of things to be celebrating uh, today rather than 150 years ago and um, spend a little bit more time on on one of our more recent uh, research project called freestyle which is curated by Shumi Bose uh, and which opened at um, the RIBA, Royal Institute of British Architects in, in London, three weeks before the first lockdown, uh, the pandemic lockdown uh, in London. And this project looks at the relationship between mass media and style and architecture and how the two have, have co-evolved. Um, here's a photograph of the exhibition, which features again, um, a digitally printed carpet, which serves as a sort of map or diagram and a large physical model and a um, spatial essay through seen through virtual reality headsets. And the brief that was given to us and how the project started was looking at the first published book by Sebastian Osario, which is volume four, which is his book on style. And what's remarkable is looking at the year, it's not maybe so long ago, and it's actually the first book ever published on architecture that contained illustrations. The previous books by Alberti uh, didn't have any illustrations. And also this is the first book on architecture that was written in the common language of Italian rather than, than Latin, which means that this is actually the first mass media object uh, about architecture ever produced in our view. Um, and in the beginning of the research project, we, we uh, looked a lot towards Mario Carpus 1994 book, Architecture in the Age of Printing analyzing what happened to Rena Renaissance architecture in Europe at the time and how it became the kind of first architecture style that was really intended to be imitated and copied. But also this notion that at the time, if you wanted to see architecture or experience a building, you had to literally travel to it and bring your body and your senses in front of it. Otherwise, you could look at a painting if you were very lucky or a drawing, which was um, rarely as accessible to most people. Um, and we really like this quote, the buildings could not travel, so people had to back in those days. And in that sense, then the book becomes literally a vehicle for buildings to travel in. And, and this began to spiral all, all sorts of new styles uh, traveling across Europe and later, of course, throughout the whole world. Uh, so the research project is very ambitious. It's looking at this enormous time period, basically 500 years. And um, the, just very briefly, the, the research project involved a few different categories um, where we looked at quite in great detail, such as mass media hardware. So literally the technology or the machines that creates media, like a printing press, and then mass media software, which we refer to as like, instead of the printing press, literally individual books or individual websites or photographs, or whatever they might be. Then of course, architectural styles. Should mention that this is only looking at the context of Britain because both mass media and style is extremely contextual. Uh, then architects and then buildings. And just here's a very, very uh, rough overview over this, the insane amount of, of databases that we created to be able to compare things like which architect had access to which libraries at the time, which books were published when, who inherited libraries, who worked with who, and most importantly, who traveled and who didn't. Again, some photographs of the exhibition itself with this large model. We were also very lucky to work with the biggest um, 
archive of architectural objects in the West, um, the RIBA's archive. So there's lots of archival objects and originals, including Serlio's uh, fourth uh, volume four. And the exhibition is organized like an, like an enormous spatial diagram. So we have the model and the carpet, and the carpet is diagonally organized according to time. Every two centimeters in the carpet is representing one year. If you know that, you can basically find your way throughout the whole exhibition. Uh, and then these splits are basically the core different styles. So basically, the point here is that the carpet Excel itself communicates um, this incredibly rapid shift in how different styles come and go. Of course, it's not quite this simple. It's a, it's a kind of big generalization. And then also all of the ornaments are actually the mass media objects, uh, some of them very common, some of them very uncommon, that were used at the time. The whole exhibition is being uh, communicated through um, an immersive film and a spatial essay in four acts, so four different headsets distributed across the exhibition as such. So you're standing literally in the time where, where the narrative is, is taking it through. You can see a person here experiencing act one, which introduces Sarah Leo in his book. And again, here we see um, the virtual guide that constantly takes you through the narrative. It, takes, it explains the beginning of the pattern books as they arrived in the UK, um, mainly then from, from mainland Europe and explain some key examples, such as in the UK context, uh, the one of the most famous architect, Christopher Wren, who built the, the big uh, church, St. Paul's in central London. Just an interesting fact, it's not so, so important, um, the specific fact, but this specific architect, he built over 50 churches uh, in central London, and uh, most of them in the Baroque style, uh, which were directly inspired from Baroque style coming from France, where he actually only went once. So his entire career um, were completely reliant on the mass media that he, because he was very wealthy, had access to constantly ordering books from, from Europe that then informed his buildings. Act two then uh, introduces the kind of wealth of translations of books coming and how it affected uh, architecture in Britain. And of course, the beginning of the age of colonialism and how then um, things began to be taken from across the world and brought to this tiny island, inspiring things like the Grammar of Ornament, which is this enormous pattern book. Um, and then towards the end of this time period, the invention of the camera and other forms of more immersive ways to transport the literal uh, visual experience of space. Act three uh, takes us through the 20th century. Uh, which of course introduces the cinema and later on the television and the experience uh, wherever you were practically of spaces from a different location, but potentially even live. So the importance of the spaces we saw in the television, like the television sets. And then later on, of course, the beginning of the interactive spaces that we could interact with in, through two dimensions through the television, such as uh, video games. And then with that comes also this, this enormous shift um, in how we use and interact with architecture at this, as a kind of palette to create atmospheres to do other things in, uh, in virtual environments. Uh, and then the beginning of the fact that, that of course, virtual architecture is created at, at uh, an insanely fast rate compared to physical architecture throughout our uh, Earth with its limited resources. And Act 4 is a speculative um, act that looks back at all the media throughout history and begins to look at what we're experiencing today with things like Pinterest, uh, where we can start to communicate uh, about styles without using words, but just using things like more like this buttons um, and how we increasingly do not describe verbally what we actually mean, but we use, use the media itself. And then it begins to speculate on what immersive media uh, and spatial media will do to, to architecture and eventually concluding on the kind of fact that we believe that um, architecture in the next 60 years will start to be created at the speed of the spoken word um, or the speed of thought even. And to kind of wrap up, we just want to show some, some view of our, our kind of work within actual virtual environments. And uh, um, I'm sure many of you uh, recognize these, this very early proto versions of 
what many refer to as the, as the metaverse that we choose to call the immersive internet. And yes, the problem I, I made it back, so I can take over ah, okay. here if you want. Yeah, yeah perfect. Um, so uh, here we see, um, again, like a series of uh, different um, social VR platforms um, that bring a spatial layer to gatherings uh, in the digital realm. But we have been particularly interested in uh, using Mozilla Hubs. Uh, you can look into the Mozilla Hubs manifesto. It's an open source platform and, and we think much more promising uh, than any other uh, technically decentralized platforms. This one uh, sort of just by being open source and because uh, of the hosting possibilities that, is, uh, that, that it offers uh, is kind of naturally um, decentralized. Uh, this is something that we experimented with um, uh, as part of the learning program uh, that, that we did uh, with the RIBA um, with uh, a long done design and engineering uh, uh, school where uh, a series of uh, high school students uh, were doing a series of workshops uh, having no previous uh, knowledge of, um, of technically, uh, no, 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 no technical skills uh, in architecture worked uh, on creating a series of worlds um, uh, using well, a series of tools that we were introducing, one of them being Mozilla Hubs and also um, a, a design method that involved a series of uh, on, uh, resources that were available online. Interestingly, we found ourselves in uh, March 2020 uh, at the opposite end of this quote, uh, where Mario Carpo was saying that back in the Renaissance, or like just before or like when printing was involved, buildings could not travel, so people had to. And we find ourselves in March 2020 in a point where people could not travel, so buildings had to. Um, so we started looking at uh, create, like what is even the meaning and the use of um, spaces that are accessible only online that don't have a physical counterpart, something that we, we had never really considered that much doing before. Um, and we created a series of experimental spaces, like the gallery that you saw before. Then uh, we could have been more encouraged by how well it was behaving to uh, basically bring the exhibition online, which was in itself a bit of a challenge because it was uh, completely thought for uh, a physical space. And we had to do something that very much resembled the, um, uh, the physical space that I was referring to. And then we got our first uh, fully virtual commission for what we would call almost uh, a civic space, um, basically a, a conference center um, for the Archia Proxima um, uh, conference uh, that was curated by Gonzalo Herrero Delicado in 2020, which usually uh, looks like this. Uh, it's, it's a very important con conference for uh, young uh, Spanish and Portuguese architects. Uh, where awards and grants uh, are given to uh, uh, very young practices. So not only this is a very important moment in their careers of those nominated and awarded, uh, but it's also a very important moment in, in which a network is created, a network of uh, a generational network, no? a network of people that is going to carry on through probably in parallel throughout their careers. So um, we understood this as a, a deep to the space. Uh, basically uh, as a website that you walk into uh, or like that you walk through and you see many spaces um, in these different rooms that we created that are that involve an element of flatness and of like 1920 by 1080 uh, format or proportions with then sort of gardens or spaces uh, resembling sort of ga gardens or leisure spaces or just simply spaces that are interesting to circulate through on the sides where you could um, step on the side if you met somebody that you wanted to hang out with while others were continuing looking at the exhibit. Uh, and then it had a central space uh, that was um, the space where lectures were given or projected by those who, uh, who preferred to join that way and where people was coming together in that space. Uh, interestingly, this brought to us the strange challenge that we never thought we had to face of designing what the people would look like in your space for technical reasons. The avatars had to be incredibly light to ensure that all devices could handle it. Um, so we, we designed this sort of card-like avatars that are basically one plane, a uh, very low polygon, um, and well, being the most important element of this 
the fact that you had spatial audio and you could identify where others were and by coming close to them you could have these uh, like side conversations and um, the last project we wanted to show um, is, is not our latest project, but uh, it relates to the work we're doing right now. It's, it's great to bright lights, which we had the pleasure of, of working on together with MMCA in Seoul, South Korea, um, at the Doksugung Palace, which is the last, the last palace of the last emperor. Um, it happens to be the in, located in the gate that leads into the emperor's private bedchambers. Uh, where we installed a large LED screen, uh, which actually blocks the, the entrance. You can actually walk around the gate because it's a freestanding structure uh, now after it, was, after it was reconstructed. But it basically serves as a kind of virtual portal that leads into that previous space as a kind of um, metaphorical commentary on, on what portals and what doorways and gateways means and what access means in the 21st century. Here we can see a snapshot of what one of the first scenes looks like when the original historic gates open leading into the doorway. And again, our kind of view that, that um, or view actually a fact that, that doors and portals before mass media were literal barriers. There were no way to see through to the other side. Of course, today a door is mere, merely a, a barrier for a body. There's potential for us to see through that door, no problem at all. With, with the live streaming and all sorts of other ways so that there's the door as separating spaces is no longer functioning in the same way which is why we don't see portals looking like this anymore and our argument that in the 21st century the gates the most revered places are are indeed virtual so that's what the film then does it kind of goes through a series of, throughout kind of media history looking at, at interfaces as if they are literal doorways uh, in creating them as sort of almost ceremonial moments uh, going through the interface of tinder uh, or uh, wechat or whichever app there happens to be and that relates to um, our current research project which um, um, will be done uh, by next summer which is on the the issues related to virtual and magical portals throughout history and what they might mean uh, to us now and what they meant in in the past uh, and that concludes our presentation today, taking you through a very rough overview of our interest and our, our recent work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura and Frederick. Now I have to figure out also how to stop sharing. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you. I'm so uh, impressed and inspired by your work, the complexity and the depth of the research and uh, the topics you have addressed uh, actually really unfolded so many uh, discussion we would have. Um, and now uh, let's take a 10 minute break uh, before we start the Q&A and roundtable discussion. So we could come back at 10 to 10, which is, I believe, 10 to 3 in the European time. Okay. See you guys later. Great, thanks. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome back. Uh, thanks so much to our guests and uh, their generosity on sharing their works, which has been really inspiring. Uh, thanks to Sean, Jack, Laura, and Frederick. Uh, you gave us unbelievable, uh, amazing presentation and, de uh, and deep reflections. So um, let's begin with the most exciting part, um, which is the Q&A and the roundtable discussion. Um, does, anyone, uh, does anyone have a question? Who is the first one? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, actually, I have a question to ask Jack. Um, yeah, Xing and I uh, graduated from uh, San Arkan Architecture School, and our instructor Peter Testa uh, recommended the article, uh, the Big Fit Now, to me, and I was inspired a lot. 
uh, so we did our graduation thesis, uh, and uh, when we when we did our graduation thesis, we were trying, uh, we did a lot of research about these articles. Uh, so we were uh, trying to flatten the time and the space, uh, freely manipulate materiality and the form, uh, the digital tools and uh, physical objects. And um, like we have already seen Big Flat Now play an important role and get success in the fashion industry. Um, so my question is, is Big Flat Now a good stra strategy for future design? Uh, and why do you think it is important? Um, and how uh, will it influence architectural design? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, it's a complex question, uh, and so I'll try to answer as best I can. The other thing I should say is it's now been several years since I wrote that article, and it's also, I have not read it since I wrote it, so I don't remember entirely what's in it. But the questions which I was asking myself at the time were to do with, um, you could call it the recycling of the past, but in a way it was uh, the, the way in which through things like an interest in vintage fashion, uh, an interest in the imagery from recent years, the way in which they now have an active role in communication and they, the, the way that the past becomes a uh, direct material for the present and the extent to which the future becomes very precarious and unknown. So uh, the future becomes much shorter and you end up in a very kind of extended present. But we were also talking about real time and we were talking about the way in which uh, the, uh, the synchronization of all people to each other through these networks creates a kind of great flatness in, in uh, networks. Um, which gives us also the impression of it always being uh, now, basically. Um, I, I actually have come to the opinion that this is not so good. Uh, at the time, I was quite optimistic about the possibility of flattening um, culture to say, well, you know, I had in my mind when I joined Twitter in 2009, I was able to write to directly to the director of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. I was a I was a student. I was living in social housing. I was very poor. I couldn't afford the bus. Uh, and then suddenly I'm talking and having a conversation with someone who is in a significant power position. And I imagine that this flatness creates this type of exchange where where power hierarchies become weaker. Um, but in the end, I, I'm not sure that that is what is happening. Uh, I think in a way the flatness actually just conceals um, lots of inequalities in terms of who controls those. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of algorithms. Um, you know, when I joined Twitter, all tweets were chronological. So it was uncontrolled. But if you think of TikTok, uh, everything is hyper-controlled. Uh, you see only what the algorithm wants to give you. Uh, and that actually damages this flatness. It makes it less flat. Um, in terms of architecture, I think we could point to collaborative design tools, perhaps like some of the work that Sean, Fred, and Lara were talking about, um, the idea of participatory design which perhaps flattens the hierarchy. You know, the architect, which is an invention, as Fred and Lara were saying, you know, it's uh, an invention of the 1500s in Italy. So it's a very particular culture and time. Um, I, I, this figure is kind of seen like an artist and a hero, you know, the person who can save society through their genius. Uh, and I think maybe this flatness that we're talking about is beginning to say that the way to address spatial uh, conditions um, is through collective and collaborative and participatory design, 
And these tools, uh, these digital tools, make that possible in a way that previous design tools, I think, didn't make that possible. Uh, so sorry for the long answer. Uh, thank you for your answer. Uh, I, th uh, I just add some comments uh, based on your answer. So uh, I noticed that you mentioned the um, Twitter uh, was chronological order and uh, the TikTok is uh, based on the algorithm. Uh, I remember Instagram was uh, like mm. a few years ago, it, it was purely chronological. But now if yeah. I uh, scroll down, scroll down, it always refresh to new posts. Uh, it seems mm -hmm. that uh, it calculates the uh, calculates to have a, ba a best uh, uh, output, best uh, ad advertising output for the for the company. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, you mentioned the um, uh, the arc the power of architect and uh, the participator par participatory design. Uh, I think for the big plan now. Uh, how it influenced our design uh, was more about the uh, formal making. Uh, for example, uh, if we mm -hmm. were going to build a skyscraper, uh, we first have a mass in form and then we slice it by the floor height and then we add the mm -hmm. uh, facade glazings. So it has hierarchy. Mm -hmm. But if we flatten the hierarchy of these elements, we could uh, Directly, we have we could uh, source the we we could have a massing uh, as A and the uh, uh, glazing shape as B and the uh, floor height as C and we we uh, freely uh, compose different elements uh, without hierarchy without order. Uh, that would mm. my um, uh, that would probably create a, a, a form mm. uh, which is. Uh, Quite free, uh, like the the texture and the form uh, is not correlational. Instead of text uh, always uh, yield to the uh, form uh, form of that three D objects. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's very interesting. Uh, I think this idea of feedback loops between different elements so that in design there may not be a hierarchy is very interesting um, but my question always about formal uh, innovation let's say is what effect does it have on the world um, you know for example uh, I can add ornamentation to any structure I design um, but some ornamentation I add, uh, but the question is why, right? Like some of the ornament that I might use is, uh, some, uh, spatial. So for example, in a house I designed last year, there was a column, which was non-structural, uh, but it was there in order to create a visual barrier between two spaces. And this for me is a, is an ornamental column. Um, even though it just looks very plain, uh, or is it communicating about a cultural condition or a financial condition, or you know what what is this kind of innovation really pointing to? Uh, because otherwise, I, I find it very difficult to make um, uh, to take an opinion um, about why something should be one way and not another, like why the floor height will be two point four meters and not. 3.8 meters. I, I don't know how to make that decision if I don't know what the effect or what the purpose is. But I don't know if uh, your own reflections on, on what I've just said and kind of, yeah, flatness and purpose. Oh, I have another question. Um... Do you think uh, John Soul Museum is a example of uh, the big flat now? Because uh, from my point of view, uh, that museum is like a cabinet of curiosities. It contains a lot of stuff from different uh, edges and from different locations. And uh, they bring all different uh, stuff um, together into that one small space. 
So uh, does it flatten the space and the time of the those different objects? What do you think? Definitely, I, I definitely agree. I think it's a very good example, uh, especially because the way that the officer is also without hierarchy. They basically are just put in the space wherever there is enough space, um, and so you get no real strong sense that there is a uh, curation or organization to these objects. They're just all present at the same time. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a good, good, good uh, observation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jack, for your uh, generous response. And uh, actually, we already have a lot of questions coming from our audiences uh, over the, um, uh, the streaming platform. So uh, I would uh, I think Hupo, you have another question. Yes, to yes, Sean. I have a, yeah, yeah. I have a question for Sean. Are you here? Uh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I noticed that you have traveled to China as a scholar. Uh, I'm not sure is that right, right? So, do you think the various landscape you met in China have any connection with what you are doing now? Any inspirations or criticism? Okay. Uh, yeah, definitely. So I guess the reason I went to China was to, so I, I had like a, a mad architects fellowship where they gave me a small amount of money to go and travel around China and kind of in, investigate a few things, um, personal investigations, I guess. Um, but what I, or what I tried to do while I was in China was try to kind of bring together this um, historical um, artifacts or historical um, emblems of, of China from like a westernized point of view, like what we visualize uh, Chinese culture or Chinese architecture, um, but then also juxtapose it with this um, kind of massive growth, obviously, in cities and the fact that you can take a, a train from um, around China for four or five hours and, and you would pass three or four cities that have not like been finalized. Um, they're sitting there as shells, um, I guess, in some ways as a credit to capitalism and the, the production. Um, but also in doing that, there's also these kind of like architectural objects that have been designed within China. Like, um, I think it's a Guangdong um, circle. Um, it's just like this big emblem or like the, the replication of, of Paris and there's this kind of weird uh, consumerism, I guess, of like Western culture that, or, or Western architecture in general, that is like supplanted into small areas of China, um, which I think is particularly interesting because there's these kind of strange um, dead zones in quite a lot of ways. Um, there's maybe a few people living there and they're kind of like ghost towns in, in some ways as well, but particularly interesting just because of the, the architectural objects that appear as these very grandiose um, emblems, I guess, of certain towns or certain cities. Um, but then when you actually approach them, sure, they might be like, kind of glittered in gold when I'm thinking of this uh, Guangzhou circle. I hope I got that right. Um, it's like this massive golden circle um, that's empty. It doesn't have anybody in it. I, like, I managed to get inside and there's a, a pretty crummy um shopping center or not even shopping center it's like a like a supermarket on the first floor and a small uh, museum on the on the ground floor but i think it's super interesting this kind of mass i guess consumerism of these architectural objects and the way that we are per we perceive uh parts of china uh, from a western perspective but also like the way that these cities are kind of built around these these architectural objects which is obviously something that we are designing Specifically, when I went, it, we were investigating quite heavily into the notion of the architectural object and some emblems of a triple O. Um, but my goal, essentially, when I was there, was to to three D scan these these strange artifacts and bring them towards more historical um, places like 
put in the circle um, on the Great Wall of China or, or something like this that contrasts both of these historical and future facing um, commercialization of uh, these architectural objects. A strange connection, I guess, but uh, nonetheless incredibly interesting. I guess I'd also just, although I've not just uh, rambled on there for a bit, but I have a question or maybe an, an addition to the point that Jack was making, or making as well about uh, the Johnson building or Johnson House or whatever we're calling it. Um, and I think one of the nice things that you spoke about is this idea that there's a flatness or a non-hierarchical ordering of uh, ornamentation or um, artifacts that have been collected. But I guess I'm, the first thing that I thought of is, um, would that be the same as uh, Amazon warehouse where there's no correlation between organization from a human uh, centered perspective? So things might be organized um, not in the way that you would expect it, for instance, at a supermarket where you would buy toothpaste beside shampoo, um, but rather in an Amazon warehouse, you might have shampoo beside, um, I don't know, architectural books because they've been correlated by an algorithm and then there's a spatial relationship that is beyond, in some ways, human comprehension. Um, so I wonder if if the irony in that is that the Johnson project is very well curated, but not in a way that we understand it. Hopefully, it's not really a question, but uh, more of a <laughs> observation. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the connection between Johnson and an Amazon warehouse is a very close one. Uh, ultimately, the question of whether information or systems are legible um, is an important one, um, but it also has to do, I think, part of moving into a kind of era of flatness is also um, the meaning of the systems no longer have to be understood by the person who is using them as part of their own creative process. So. You could say, for example, I mean, certainly John Sohn had an idea about why objects are where they are. Now, because I don't understand the history of those objects or understand the context of them, I can't read that in the same way that if I enter an Amazon warehouse, I don't know why the algorithm which has decided to put those objects next to each other is invisible to me. However, the objects are there and therefore I will uh, be able to create a connection out of it. And I think in terms of social media, I may not understand the origin of a photograph from the 1970s or uh, the context of um, a car from the 1990s. But the two of those images next to each other immediately begins to create a space which is between it, which is the input or the inspiration for another layer of design. Uh, so in that sense, the ability to arrange, rearrange by coincidence or by, or by intent, all sorts of different types of material, which is no longer categorized by any type of hierarchy, uh, is in itself, I think, um, well, it's, it, it's leading to some issues as well. I mean, one of the issues is it's, it's not really possible anymore to escape trends. Um, because the material that's being presented to you is no longer random, actually. It's now being curated by other algorithms. So what you think you're yeah. discovering, you're not discovering. Um, but it, it is having another positive effect, which is that I think less and less we are asking or expecting to see things which are new. Uh, what we're interested in is whether things are relevant. Um, and the difference between newness and relevance is... Uh, newness is something that you've never seen before, and relevance uh, is about something which has a meaningful communication to you today. Uh, it, it appears it could be a very familiar object or image or piece of communication, but it, it appears at the moment which um, seems to uh, contribute to um, your understanding of the world. And we see it more and more in fashion that there is less newness and more relevance. And we see it also in 
I mean, architecture isn't quite there yet. There's still an obsession, I think, with newness in architecture, which hopefully will move beyond soon. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Uh, I think this dialogue is really, um, really amazing. And I'm actually, I think the analog uh, between uh, Amazon and the Johnson Museum is really interesting. And I'm wondering, how is your reflection, uh, Frederick and Lara? What would you say about this uh, particular case? Um, well, thanks for bringing us in, Eva. Um, I think one one thing to that would I think be interesting to reflect on here as a kind of umbrella issue to all of this, which could seem as something unproductive or even halting. Um, I mean, we've talked about where things have come up relating to nostalgia and other things, but I think one key thing, uh, Jack, you mentioned legibility, and then this abstract reading of something like a house museum and uh, mm -hmm machine of a warehouse. Um, I think one thing that is always very important to keep in mind with when we are interacting between different disciplines, like I think all of us are, and this seems like um, um, everyone here and the audience perhaps as well, is how coming from architecture and maybe in all of our cases touching a little bit on art, etc., that terminology is incredibly loose and therefore legibility is also very loose and which means that interpretations can can run wild completely um which means that you can have incredible agency with using a word like flatness for in uh, sorry jack i haven't read this article but but the word flatness can be used in such a myriad of ways i think we were using it as well in our talk in a very different way from what you were using it jack and from what the question was about uh, flatness and these issues in formal design of buildings like that those things can be spoken about with the same word means that um, we could see it as a problem but I think it's something that is important to almost uh, invite because we're not going to get beyond it like to in order to deal with a session like this especially that's cross-continental and there's people from all over the world we would need like a glossary and say like we don't care what words you use in your day-to-day -day practice these are the words we use here you know for us for instance we don't use the word in metaverse we talk about the immersive internet we interact a lot with the tech world where you cannot really say architect because they think you're a, a technical architect like a tech architect like literally i don't know how many times this happened when we've been in conferences and discussions say i'm an architect they go like yeah i'm also an architect it's like no no the the other kind and they go like what other kind um there's so many examples of where and obviously in their world, terminology often is consequential. Like what you call something has consequences for either the economy mm. of, of your company, et cetera, or uh, where the exchange between people has real consequences. Like, whereas I think in many of the examples that we probably move around in, if we actually agree on what a word means, it has less consequence. It could be interesting if we end up like, yeah, flatness could mean this. But we also we accept all other forms of interpretations. I think that's just an interesting like, and it is why you get these like incredibly weird comparisons between sorry, the Johnson Museum and an Amazon warehouse. Uh, and it, I think in a, in a in a sense we could get lost in those comparisons. But it's also something I think to celebrate as long as we know that we're making these, we're playing with these comparisons. Right, yeah. uh, and they have the potential to become consequential if we can agree on the legibility and the syntax of how we how are we going to read these things? Because um, we see a lot of diversity, but also a lot of like quite um, unproductive like overlaps. Where like we could probably probably worked on the exact same arguments, we just call them different things, and we would never know. <laughs> mm. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Uh I think uh, it's actually like constructing kind of parallel of this terminology or like overlapping uh, idea or concepts uh, nowadays in the immersive internet is becoming quite, I, I, was, I would think it's quite uh, interesting and inspiring on how we define the disciplines and how we actually uh, see what we conventionally uh, would regard it.
and uh, now uh, we have another audiences to raise their questions. So, so would you like to ask your question? Hi, Frederick. Uh, since I really appreciate for your generous sharing work and knowledge, uh, I would like to ask that do you think it would be a trend of uh, architects to embrace digital art related to the book, especially in the context of, uh, of China? And what would be your advice for young generation architects? Deciding to switch their career from traditional uh, architectural industry to digital era. I I think I missed some of that there, but I I'm gonna go with what I heard. <laughs> so, the my understanding of the question was that uh, like some sort of, I guess, advice on an architect switching from or switching towards more of a digital art artist, right? Was that correct? Right. Okay. Yeah. So I think um the first thing from my perspective is that there shouldn't be a differentiation. Um I think we are our architects are in a sphere that anything spatial is within our domain. Um not to be to uh, master builder about it, but I think we are we're capable uh, within within any kind of spatial realm to investigate architectural ideas and architectural um, concerns, whether that's through digital art or mixed realities or um, something as simple as like an Instagram or Facebook filter. Um, I think these are within architectural um, or within the architectural realm. The same way as I think that. Um, architects are, are predominantly very great um, game designers as well, not so much in the programming side of things, but more in the, the sense of being able to orchestrate or construct space in a specific narrative, um, whether it's combining new aesthetics or like some sort of spatial sequence. So I think in terms of that, I think lean into the skills you have as an architect. Um, that is a spatial thinker. I think there there doesn't have to be this kind of distinction between I'm an architect, therefore I need to build buildings and I need to um, do documentation in Revit or, or something like this, but rather it's just taken this framework or this education that we've been given, I guess, is within spatial, um, I guess, design. Um, I think that's the the way that I would approach it in terms of how I would approach being a digital artist as well is thinking purely spatial because I think that's one thing that architects have as a as an advantage. Um, it's not this type of um, language or the type of design is not articulated very clearly if you're becoming like a, a graphic designer. Um, it's it's a different different set of rules, I guess. So yes, sense. and it, if I may add to that, I think Sean was putting it very well. There is also another side to that argument, no? That is, uh, if you speak very directly of um, how does a practice sustain itself if you don't define what you provide? No? I mean, in the end, in in a very simple way, people will hopefully come to you looking for something. On the other hand, I mean, you may initiate your own um your own projects um if you go more the way that sean is describing you'll probably end up uh basically promoting your or producing and, and making your own projects happen uh, in which case you might end up more in the realm of um, platform building which uh, has a completely different time span um to the sort of architectural project um that goes on a com on commission basis um, and on the other hand, if um, if you would like to work with commissions, then I think you kind of have to uh, sit yourself in in one place that people can understand. Now, whether you can carve out that role for yourself, um, usually through through media, 
through the way you made yourself be perceived uh, and therefore be found. Uh, you might carve that role for yourself, but you still kind of need to define it. And this is coming from somebody who like, we've been trying really hard to not be pigeonholed. And uh, and in the end, maybe the answer is to be pigeonholed in four or five roles <laughs> to maintain maybe that variety um, that that's some people is interested in right but I do think that even if um, roles and, and disciplines uh, evolve quite uh, at a quite a fast pace it's, it's, it's kind of professionally it is important uh, in order to really move at a at the pace that you may want in terms of getting commissions and working on projects and so on it, it is important to define uh, that role in in some way so. I think that's super interesting because I think personally, I think that's one thing that I struggle with in terms of trying to describe myself as a single, a single entity, whether I'm an architectural designer or um, an XR developer or any of these other kind of um, umbrella terms. I think the, the interesting thing for me, and I'm sure anyone that has freelanced or done any of these kind of commission based projects clients seem to find you and then project uh, what they want from you. Um, sometimes, or from my perspective anyways, it's never been someone coming and saying, I've seen you do this, replicate it. It's more the client comes with an idea and then somehow expects you to fulfill that idea. Whether it's within the realm of uh, digital art or um, coding or building a video game or, or whatever, I feel like there is um, there's always the flexibility of being able to kind of take on roles. And I think it sounds like a super entrepreneurial thing, but from, I think it's like Richard Branson that said something like, um, if you get offered a job and you don't know how to do it, tell them yes, and then you'll figure out how to do it. So I think from that perspective, I think just being able to uh, work flexibly and think flexibly about the way that you approach some of these things from from that side of things, business side of things, I think, I think it's, I think it's fine to be open ended. But I think you might, yeah, like Lara said, you might end up picking up more um, commissions if you're very specific. My comments are quite general and relate to how to approach your career. Uh, the first design problem of any designer, not just architects, is how to design yourself and how to design your practice, which could be your company or could be your public image. And so the way that I thought about this myself was I asked myself some very simple questions. Um, do I like to work in a team or do I like to work by myself? Uh, do I like to be the boss or do I, am I okay to be an employee? Uh, do I want to work um, always in an office or do I want the flexibility to work from home or in another type of place? Um, how much money do I want to earn? You know, in my case, this was a, it sounds like a very uh, banal, like not a creative question, but it's important because if you want to have a family, if you want to own property, then you cannot choose certain paths. Uh, I, and so when I asked myself a lot of these questions, it began to make clear a kind of space where I, the types of companies I could work for, the types of jobs I could do. And then I started describe. the next thing I did after that was I wrote my own biography. You know, these days most people have, or many people have a personal website or a professional website. And there's like a about page. And even if you haven't created the company, even if you don't know what you will do, even if Oops. Sorry, Jack, we lost you. We lost a minute. 
hopefully can can yeah sorry what i was saying is as yeah. soon as you start to write your about page as soon as you start to put it in words you already create the reality that you want to live in and anyone who reads it if you say uh my work is about exploring the future of the digital everyone who reads it will go ah his work is about the future of exploring the digital, even if you've never done a project that is in that field. Um, so, yeah, so I, the two things I would encourage are first asking questions about how you like to work. How, you know, do you want to be a big public figure or are you actually a private person? Uh, you know, what, what uh, do you want to have 100 million followers or actually do you not care about followers? Uh, and why, why would you, what is the value of that? You know, do you want to be part of a community? Do you want to live in the mountains? I mean, there's many questions like this, which can help you to define, uh, even before you get to the question of, you know, am I going to do work in physical architecture or digital architecture, or as Sean so rightly said, the not recognizing the difference between the two or saying that they are all one. Anyway, I conclude by just saying that uh, I've been calling myself an architect uh, since uh, I finished my first degree, which was three years long. And um, I, was not, I hadn't yet finished my master's degree. And in the United Kingdom, you have to do an exam to, become, to call yourself an architect uh, once you graduate. But I've been calling myself an architect before that because that's how I felt I wanted to describe myself. And even when I work in the world of fashion, or even when I work in the world of graphic design or magazines, uh, I always insist that I'm an architect. And because they say like, well, architects don't do this. You know, architects don't do creative direction. And I'm like, well, I'm an architect and I'm doing it. So yeah, they can. Um, uh, yeah, anyway, that's, that's it for me. I hope that yeah. was helpful in some way. Yeah, it's really helpful. And uh, speaking of discipline, uh, it kind of reminded me of uh, the conversation that we had yesterday with a very young digital artist. And uh, he said that he is not a fan of perfection. So when he starts to work, he kind of start with uh, scratches and like simple iteration of objects. And so he kind of take this iteration as what defines his work. So I, I'm wondering maybe in the future, in the digital world, in the metaverse, maybe there will be no discipline, or maybe we have like, we will construct like uh, iteration or like layers of disciplines. And I mean, in this age that everyone is kind of DJing uh, the music, maybe, <laughs> I don't know if there's a chance that the, the boundary will be blurred and there will be more like an anonymity for everyone to be a designer, be an artist, be an architect. And yeah, I think it's, um, it's a really interesting topic to address too. Can I say something to that though? Because yeah. I, I don't, I, I think the idea that everyone can be involved in design is, is a really good idea, but we have to be very careful about how they are involved in design because it's a little bit like saying everyone should be a doctor. Mm -hmm. It's like, it, it, you should have a lot of control over your body and over your health. But in the end, a doctor is a professional body of knowledge. And even though I work in fashion, in graphic design, in magazines, in art direction, photography, and so on, I am not a graphic designer. I'm not a fashion designer. Uh, and that, because I recognize that that is a special body of knowledge, which takes a long time and requires a lot of uh, yeah professional knowledge to to do. So I, I'm very big fan of interdisciplinary collaboration. You know what happens? How do we talk when an architect and an artist and other types of designers when they work together? Uh, what can they produce which is maybe more than all of those disciplines? But mm -hmm. the idea that we have no disciplines anymore, I think will mean that we will lose a lot of specialist knowledge because it's not possible to know everything about, for example, how to print uh, a book. There's, you know, it's a huge body of knowledge. 
in the same way that it's not possible for a print designer to know how to make a building. Um, it's, there's a lot of knowledge involved. Uh, so yes, I'm really interested in this extra layer, which is a space where we can collaborate. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't want to remove disciplines. I, I think I, I completely agree with that. And um, I mean, you can think uh, about this even like in the earliest forms of ceremony involves the formation of roles so that we can do something that is greater than one of us alone. Mm. Right. So you can think about it in a very pure and romanticized mm. way um, that hopefully not the, the specializations, uh, the establishment of roles sometimes can go really wrong. But when it's at its best is so that we can do something mm. greater that what one of us could do together. You know? And in, in that sense, then it becomes really fundamental. Mm. Um, and I think in understanding uh, disciplines that seem a bit where but for some reason it's harder to understand what that specialization is because it's sort of easy to access, like design. Um, I, I like almost the comparison to like, I think another field to which this happens slightly is um, therapy or psychology, where one would think that you can help a friend by having a conversation and you probably can to a certain extent but you will never mm. be doing that which um, a therapist would do. You would never mm. ask the questions that that person asks. You would never take it uh, from those angles just simply because you don't have that body of knowledge. Right? So I think that will probably be the the, um, the angle, that, which is precisely what Jack was saying. Um, of course, when we're talking about a discipline being based on a body of knowledge, um, there is always the question of uh, whether that body of knowledge will eventually be able to be computed in a certain way, right? And then this is very much a reality. I, I think that is what will be interesting. Um, or like, what to me is most interesting is that which cannot be computed, no? Which takes you to the essence of what humans are good at. Um, or what humans will remain to be good at. And maybe I'm, I'm jumping quite ahead. Um, but I think that the, if you are always thinking about that you and applying that to yourself, like what is it really that I can offer that nothing else can offer, as opposed to creating the illusion of you being able to offer something that uh, actually maybe everyone can do by themselves, then you will probably find a lot more of a sense of purpose in, in what you do. Maybe one thing that's kind of interesting about the design, um, I guess, education and alongside it, the pedagogy, um, is that there's like a, a mass democratization of design, I guess, language, design, education through, through software or through tools, where there's this perception that architecture, um, graphic design um, uh, and a whole series of other um, design disciplines can be learned or can be harnessed by knowing Photoshop, by knowing Rhino, by knowing um, some of these other tools that are like the fundamentals for the discipline, which I think is in some ways kind of strange um, because there is this body of knowledge that I guess that architects and designers uh, harness um, but I guess one thing that I was thinking about when we were talking about it there was the way that this body of knowledge is retained as like a repository. So if you just think from a purely like software engineering side of things, um, the fact that there's so many of these open source projects on GitHub or repositories of um, coding knowledge that basically through, oh, I'm sure a whole series of uh, YouTube videos and projects yourself, you can actually become... Um, a software engineer or a developer. And I think there's this kind of perception that you can do the same with many of these um, design disciplines. And I think fundamentally you can, you can learn quite a lot about architecture through YouTube. Um, and I think in that way, there's a question though, is discipline really like as segmented as we, as we think it is? And if it is, um, are we kind of clinging on to a hierarchy to feel important in many ways? 
um, because I I kind of question whether that knowledge is is so much more um, learned through higher education, or if I can learn by doing in many ways, um, the same way as a software engineer can without going to study computer science for four years. Not to put a. <laughs> no, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, we shouldn't just say that all knowledge of a discipline or profession comes through university. Uh, it has a lot to do with, I would say, much more, you know, the role of, of university, if it has a role at all. Oh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Yeah. If university has a role at all, it's to provide a basis so that you can uh, have a structure to how you interpret your experience. Um, so a lot of people can gain a lot of experience of a discipline uh, through experience, um, but sometimes that information is not necessarily very well structured. Uh, at least for me, the value of university is in the end nothing to do with content, it's to do with structure. So what I got out of university was the ability to make an argument the ability to organize information, the ability to execute a project, um, how to understand these types of things. Uh, and then all the other knowledge I have is through experience. I think that's really, really nice the way to look at it because I think you're kind of, or what I got out of university is like being, or learning to learn or learning or teaching yourself or teaching mm. through um, an educator, the way in which you can learn yourself um in many ways because i think you're kind of fond or like you go on youtube for sure or you go on some articles online or read uh, the latest log or, or whatever um you're trying to digest this information and i think it it's a nice way to, to put that perspective that's quite hard to to structure that information in a in a useful way in many ways to actually be um yeah no i think that's interesting Yeah, I think this is a really interesting conversation. Uh, I mean, constructing the alternative kind of version as the repository is quite an interesting topic to bring up. And uh, uh, speaking of that, we have another question coming from our audience and I, I will read this. Uh, uh, there's no doubt that post-digital design should be a topic of uh, far beyond time space scale. But when we think about digital vision in the architecture or urbanism territories, we really cannot avoid scale. How do you think uh, about the relationship between the object in this topic and scaling module in our original discipline? Um, uh, would you like to, would anyone to answer this question from our audience? It's very broad, no? The, um... Yeah. The question, but the, I, we, we can try and, and, and address this. To begin with, I think that um, the, this term post-digital is, is uh, not super useful because it's, it's prone to so many misunderstandings because uh, post is often understood as something being quite direct and uh, people understand what that means. Um, of course, in many ways, one could read that as being <laughs> we're not going to anything post-digital at all, rather the reversed. Um, but in terms of, if I understood correctly, at scale, um, a sort of urbanism, etc., uh, that's something that, that architects traditionally have been quite bad at handling, or at least in the generation that we have been trained in. I think um, we are similar similar generation, all of us, that were kind of at the back end of the super object heavy individual building um, heavy era of architecture where all that matters was that if your output was discrete and containable that you could photograph the, the building or it could be understood in a context whereas i think now um, at least education and i think gen practice generally is much more uh, concerned which I think is very positively uh, beyond the individual object and looking at bigger context, which I think has really interesting implications. And I think you can see it uh, probably 
probably I, I do not have enough experience of China, but I think from an external perspective, it seems very, very telling that there is a very, very strong period in architecture where there's a lot of object focused architecture that was then abruptly ended with a then focus more on how big, big systems connect and how system, cities connect. Uh, is it nice to live in between these big objects or not? Um, and, and less of a focus on, on what the individual buildings can do. And that certainly links up with what digital systems and urbanism is good for. Um, at least if you think about how they have been designed to work, whether they end up being good for us or not. Um, it's another it's another question uh, with uh, tracking and monitoring, etc. That at the at the moment can be superficially seen as something positive for a lot of us. That you don't need to carry around cash, etc. Very very simple things that we don't really ever think about. Or that you can magically get almost any vehicle to your location at any given time. These kind of large things that have much, much bigger implication than what the buildings happen to be doing. I mean, I think by and large, there's been very little innovation in in the object of architecture uh, in the last 50 years or so. Uh, so certainly probably um, the uh, development of digital twins uh, will be the next big phase, uh, but the vast majority in, in, in the next 50 years will have to do with that personal experience uh, of of uh, at that at that scale, and that's probably also why we see migration going away from this like designing enormous skyscrapers that look like whatever random thing, um, and uh, more towards how we actually use them, uh, using them intelligently. And I think also this links very interestingly to what Jack was saying earlier about uh, newness. And if I understood you correctly, Jack, you were. Uh, saying that hopefully this fascination with newness will be over soon in architecture. And I think that this is something that goes in in waves that relates to big, big energy leaps or big stages in innovation. Or if you can look at previous times in human history when there were certain limitations on in innovation, that meant that um, I love this this quote from Heinrich Wölflin, the German uh, art critic, who said that uh, ornament is the blossoming of a force that has nothing more to achieve. But basically, when everything has been done uh, and there's nothing more obvious to do, then we ornament and we decorate. And that doesn't mean that ornamentation is less than anything else. It just means that if, if you're busy and you don't have time or money or resources, or you're really busy with doing things that, that actually produce things, then by and large, ornamentation might be accidental. But by and large, it's not, you don't spend time on it in the way that in certain moments in history, uh, ornamentation is done uh, a lot more frequently. So I think that's also another really interesting um, aspect where I think at the moment there is relatively little innovation in, in the creation of buildings themselves, uh, which is why all ornamentation are virtual and digital. And you know, if you actually consider the design of interfaces and gaming and clothing and architecture, and effects and events in virtual environments, the amount of newness is so fast and that we can't call it newness because it just, it just, you know, it's the opposite of Wolfin's argument almost. It just happens by itself because the possibilities are there and endless, whereas our cities remain gray and ghost-like for the moment. But of course, when media becomes yeah. spatial, that will change radically. I I, I agree with you completely, although I don't think that the digital is and media is, is the driver of that. Um, I mean, I, I feel a little bit awkward to be at this uh, meeting because my company is called Real and where I am at the moment is after having worked for the last five years to create a very specific type of housing product. I have now got seed funding and I'm about to go to a main round of funding so that I can deliver housing. And that housing is a passive house, high density passive house. Um, so it has very low uh, energy and uh, water use. 
um, and uh, is trying to design for high levels of adaptability into the future. So thinking about how family structures and ways that we work or live might change over the next 100 years. How do you design housing that can anticipate such change? Um, and what's driving that, uh, and I'm also, you know, we're working on, or we have designed um, uh, a system of advanced prefabrication, uh, which uses a combination of steel and mass timber in order to reduce the carbon footprint of the housing. Now, wh why am I telling you all of this? And why are we doing this? Uh, the reason why we're doing this is because the built environment is responsible for about 39% of all carbon emissions and is responsible for almost, fit, almost half of all waste that comes from construction or demolition. So the environmental impact of our built environment is really massive. And if we are going to avoid climate crisis more than it has already hit us, we will have to fundamentally and radically change the way that we make buildings. So this newness, um, yeah, it's mainly a technological newness, but it also has a real cultural dimension to it as well. Uh, in terms of how we think about the future of how we will live. Uh, so yeah, so I, I'm maybe, I see the innovations in media and the digital as being uh, maybe parallel to that. But I, I do also think there will be very, very big changes in how technically we make objects like buildings. Hopefully you heard that, not quite sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we heard. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's really interesting. Uh, and uh, I have a quite general question to all of our guests. Um, uh, the, this, this, uh, the discourse of media has been evolved with the immersive internet. Uh, in this drastically change from writing as, media, and as a medium to communicate with audiovisual, uh, indeed, the medium is the message. So how uh, this media has reflect your pre uh, our presence and our reality, and uh, how could you do with the emergence of this media? And uh, speaking of uh, the way you kind of deliver your practice, um, all of you chose different medias to uh, express yourself. And uh, for example, Jack, speaking of his uh, um, ambitions in housing, and he's also an architect writer editor, which uh, he used language in the reading context to kind of perform his work. And uh, Lauren, Frederick, and uh, my column, uh, uh, Sean, and uh, we see in their work that there's a diverse use of media uh, from uh, film to 3D uh, spa space and simulations. Mm -hmm. Uh, AR objects. So, how did these kind of media uh, affect the way you uh, your kind of express in your work? And how did you choose to use this media to reflect your um, idea? Um, I think for us, it's they kind of go hand in hand, or they, they always have done uh, since we started the studio. Um, like part of the, the research has always been kind of investigating the role of tools and the implications of, I guess, in some ways, creating our own, our own tools and new tools and what the outcome of these uh, new tools might be. I think hopefully this answers the, the question, but we've been quite i guess invested in thinking about i guess the traditional tools that architects have but then there's a pretty long standing tradition with people like um hernandez alonso that obviously take something like zbrush or a sculpting tool and bring it into architecture there's always there's obviously greg uh greg lynn bringing um maya into the fray um and animation software in general within architectural design and architectural 
education as well. Um, and I think we are at a point, not so much just the studio, but I think um, architectural education, architectural discipline, we're at a point where we're capable and have the, the tools necessary to build our own tools on top of that um, for very specific use cases. Um, and quite a lot of that feeds into this narrative that we were speaking about earlier with combining community able, enabled design um, within a framework that the architect has kind of curated um, because there is this understanding that if you just ask everyone to give their opinion, you kind of end up with a, a jumbled mess. Um, and it's, it's quite difficult to uh, categorize or pull out the specific points in, of value from that type of discourse. Um, but one thing that's interesting for us anyway is to build these tools that allow people to work together. So we predominantly utilize things like Unity 3D, uh, which gives us the, the capabilities of video game engines. And of course, if you have any um, understanding or interest in coding, then the world is kind of your oyster, um, specifically within that, that discipline, because there is the capabilities of providing your own algorithms, your own set of rule cases that people can play within and utilizing something that feels quite um, simple and easy and understandable like video games um, makes the potential of architecture in a participatory fashion um, more, more understandable, but also more fruitful um, because you can provide the variables which make uh, the design, I guess, like I said, more, more fruitful um, rather than giving um, 100,000 different opinions and then trying to filter through this process. You can define those to begin with. Um, and I think that's one of the fundamentals for us anyway, when thinking about architecture and architecture uh, tooling um, as a way to, yeah, provide these, these sort of frameworks and systems. Mm -hmm. Yes, responding yeah. quickly to that, um, I think yes, in our please. case, well, I guess it's it's also the case with, with well, Jack, Jack as well, exploring many different uh, mediums. In our case, it's the medium itself is is often literally the topic of the of this of the work itself, um, from an historical perspective, uh, which is also why we explore a lot of different mediums. Um, and I know that um, both uh, Irop Lob and Jack has kind of either worked with or written about um, the use of real-time software, like you were mentioning, Sean. Um, and without going into too much detail, I think for us, um, having used a lot of different mediums, uh, one medium that really sets itself apart, um, which is sadly quite uh, difficult to work with currently and requires a lot of a lot of efforts, but to create um, either films or experiences that are spatial um, through spatial mediums themselves um, is, I think, what we enjoy the most when it comes to specific mediums to work with, like literally, in this case, wearing a headset, um, but that's less relevant. It's just what we happen to have to do today. Um, probably not quite soon, but literally to stand inside of the computational world uh, and being able to visualize it um, um, that's certainly like I think the medium that we that we enjoy working with the most. Yes, uh, I have a question. Actually, I, I want to add on to that uh, a little bit. Uh, does any uh, limitation from the media kind of uh, inspire your work, or uh, is there any kind of uh, opportunity that you found in the limitation from the media, as you mentioned, the headset? And um, yeah, uh, this is to yeah. yeah, constant, constantly, constantly. I think it's generally very important to to be aware that even if the the tools you're using are mind blowingly exciting, and you're in that kind of context where, um, like, generally in in creation of virtual spaces, gaming, films, whatever it happens to be. There's so many possibilities that it's hard to see the limitations of the tool. I think it's always very important to be uh, enjoy working with them when you do, but always be um, see them just as tools 
and and not and not fall too much in love with with the tools you're using um, to be open to replace them and to see how they might either be uh, kind of inhibiting you uh, in whatever you're trying to create uh, or that they are less collaborative than other tools or, or whatever it might be um, because we see that of course again and again and again in different disciplines that the medium itself becomes a kind of the the bearer of what's either acceptable or respectable um, um, and which systems they kind of tap into etc um, yeah Yes. Um, do you want to add to um, this, Mario? Oh, oh, Jack. Yeah. Yeah. So I think in the beginning of this conversation, there was also a, a, a lot of talk about access to amounts of information and how that information is curated. So it was, uh, I think, is a nice closing maybe back onto that. And I think that the medium in which we are all practicing one way or another is. Uh, the reference library you know, or the knowledge sets uh, that we have uh, access to. And I think that how you set that up for yourself ends up influencing so much um, the decisions that you make and the angles that you take on your work. Um, so I think that is the bit that, that has the most, uh, the, the greatest impact, both in terms of what it offers, uh, you know, like what you choose to look at, what, how do you compose your library? Um, but also how limited that might be, um, you know, and as we're saying, like, I don't know, a couple of centuries ago, you would be limited by your ability to have access to things like books. And now you might be even more limited to your ability to see beyond um, what's on offer or to see beyond what's curated in front of your eyes. You know? and, and, and with that defining what is the audience, like for whom uh, are you working? and therefore defining purpose based on that so i think there is where maybe i think that's what has the greatest impact in anything that's that we do beyond any kind of hardware or software is is that i would agree and i would say that uh of course i work with words uh as Your words are not reaching us. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Oh, oh. yes, you are. Yes, we can hear okay. you. Can you can you hear me? Okay. Yes. No. Uh -oh. Yes. 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 Oh no! no we lost him. Stop, stop my video. Hopefully, you can hear me better. Okay. Yeah, we no? can hear you. Yes. 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 Okay. So what, what I was saying was, um, uh, you know, I work with words as much as I do images, drawings, and other forms of communication. And I'm very aware of the limit that words have. But the example I wanted to give was that most people who are listening to this probably speak Mandarin as a first language. And they have learned this tool, which is these English words. Uh, but in the end, you can learn all the English words, so many English words, but what do you want to say? Um, so the tool of the language doesn't necessarily lead to a better uh, or more precise outcome. And I think about that for all technology, uh, you know. You cannot say in English, and there's a beauty to that. Uh, at the same time, um, ultimately, we need to know uh, what these different tools can be used for and therefore why we are using them and what we want to achieve. Otherwise, we do end up in this very kind of like technology for the sake of technology, whether that's language. And I, I'm not making a judgment on computers, whether that's language, whether that's drawing, whatever it might be. Uh, the exercise of the tool is not in itself 
uh, an interesting proposition, I think. Yes, um, in that, um, so it's about time that we end uh, today. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we're so honored to have you. And uh, I believe this discussion can continue for hours. And uh, unfortunately it's 11 at night in China and it's Friday, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, actually, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you to everyone involved in establishing this. This is a really wonderful series and a really wonderful project. And I really congratulate you all. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I really look forward to uh, probably hosting our next uh, discussion seminars uh, in the near future and uh, to kind of publishing and uh, broadcasting your works uh, here. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today, uh, tonight. And um, yeah, let's call it a night. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for inviting <laughs> us and for organizing Thanks this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lara, thank you. Frederick, Sean, Jack. <laughs> Thanks very much for having me. Nice thank to see you, you all. So Bye. Much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Nice to meet you. Bye. Bye. See you later. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye.